This lecture is on fluid compartments. In this lecture, we will describe the distribution of fluids within body compartments, define and calculate total body water, discuss how total body water varies with age, sex, and percent body fat, and define osmolarity and tonicity within the human body. Understanding fluid regulation within the body is key to many clinical conditions that involve fluid, electrolyte, and acid-base regulation. This fluid is mostly water and is measured as total body water. Fluid inside a cell is intracellular fluid, abbreviated as ICF. Fluid outside of the cell is extracellular fluid, abbreviated as ECF. We also divide the extracellular compartment into two separate compartments. The compartment between cells is interstitial fluid, sometimes ISF, and the fluid within the blood, which is intravascular fluid, usually referred to as blood plasma or serum. The sum of fluids within all body compartments is total body water. Let's look at this diagram a little more closely. Typically, we use what we call the average 70 kilogram male. Of course, we know that this is not representing a large part of the population, but it makes for a simple calculation and it's a starting point. We will talk about how this varies across different populations and age groups as well. So let's look at our 70 kilogram male and these are the compartments. So here we're measuring total body water. We divide that total body water into the ICF, intracellular fluid, and the ECF, extracellular fluid. From there, we divide the extracellular fluid into plasma and interstitial fluid. Let's look at how we calculate total body water. Total body water is approximately one-third ECF and two-thirds ICF, meaning that most of the water in our bodies is within the cells. We then look at the ECF compartment, and we can see that the ECF compartment within that one-third, one-quarter of that is plasma, and three-quarters of that is interstitial fluid. You're going to want to write down these numbers and remember them as we move forward in our calculations. So how do we start? First, we need to convert the weight in kilograms. Here we use pounds, most commonly, so we're going to convert pounds to kilograms. One pound is 0.45 kilograms. Total body water is 60% of the body weight. From that, then, if we take one-third of 60%, that's 20%. That will give us our ECF. So if you have your body weight, you take 20% of body weight and you'll get your ECF. Two-thirds of 60% is 40%. So if you're given body weight, you take 40% of that and you get your ICF. And we could use the same logic to get the ECF compartments. Plasma is one quarter of that one-third. So one quarter of 20% is 5%. Interstitial fluid is three quarters of that one-third. So interstitial fluid is 15% body weight. So an easy way to remember this is 60, 20, 40. So if we give you the body weight for an individual, you can very quickly estimate that as 60, 20, and 40% of that given body weight in kilograms. That's an estimate for your average male. Females have a slightly higher percent body fat. So for females, the percent body weight is slightly different. For a female, the total body water is 50% of body weight. And then you can use the same logic of calculations to get your individual percentages for those. It's important to think about the fluid gains and losses in the body. Total body water is regulated by fluid intake and fluid loss. Here we have a chart from your textbook of daily intake and daily output of normal water gains and losses for that 70 kilogram male. Daily intake includes drinking, water in our food, and water produced by oxidation through cellular metabolism. 
That total is about 2,400 to 3,200 milliliters per day, or 2.4 to 3.2 liters. To keep everything balanced, then the daily output from the body should also be similar. We excrete or lose water in the urine, the stool, the skin through sweat, and the lungs through evaporation. If we look at those, the majority of water loss is through the urine. We add all of those up, and the total is very similar to the normal water gains in the previous column. This is why it's important to make sure that ourselves and our patients are drinking and eating enough and including enough fluids in their diet. So let's look a little bit at the age differences. Severe loss of body fluids can be life-threatening. Children, particularly babies, and older adults are especially susceptible to dehydration. For children, newborn infants are extremely at risk because they have very low body fat, very high metabolism, and a greater body surface area for evaporative loss. In a very small child, a small amount of water loss can mean a lot for their total body water. All infants are at risk due to low body weight, and that's partly also due to immature renal conservation of fluids. As children get older, approaching adolescence, and approaching more adult ages, their levels begin to match more adult levels, and they begin to display the gender differences that we saw in the previous slides. Older adults are also at risk due to declining renal function, impairing the conservation of fluids. Water loss through the skin increases, and thirst perception, as with other sensory perceptions, can decline with age. If we look over on the column here on the side, you'll see that one of the main signs of dehydration or loss of fluid is decreased skin turgor. In fact, it's those physical signs and symptoms that you're going to look for as clues for loss of body fluid. Fluid balance is determined primarily by water, sodium, and plasma proteins. As we discussed in previous lectures, water moves freely between the ECF and the ICF. It does this because there are numerous aquaporin channels in the cell membrane that allows that water to pass freely. Those aquaporin channels, if they're present, are always open. This means that the ECF and the ICF can reach an equilibrium with respect to water balance. In the upcoming sodium lecture, you will see that sodium is the primary electrolyte in the ECF. So the amount of sodium is going to drive the osmotic balance in the extracellular compartment. Remember that water follows salt. So as sodium rises in the extracellular compartment, water will also move to the extracellular compartment to balance that out. Another very important component of fluid balance are the plasma proteins, primarily albumin, that are produced by the liver. Albumin within the blood maintains the effective osmolality of the plasma, meaning that the amount of albumin within the blood helps to maintain water in the blood, and maintaining that osmolality in balance with the interstitial and intracellular compartments. Losing albumin means that you can lose water within your plasma. Osmolality, if you remember, is the amount of solute within a fluid. And remember, we don't distinguish between the type of solute when, it's, when it comes to osmolality. This could be salt, sugar, any solute that helps to draw the fluid into the compartment. The osmolality of blood ranges from 280 to 294, 275 to 299, you will see different numbers, but it's approximately 300 milliosmoles, and that's an easy way to remember it. Just remember it around 300. In the body, this is primarily determined by sodium levels in the ECF, that is assuming that the album albumin levels are constant. In what direction will fluid move with respect to solute concentration? Remember? Think about it for a second. Fluid follows salt. 
So when the solute concentration increases, the fluid will follow, and it will leave other compartments to move to those compartments with higher solute concentration. How does that affect cells? Well, this, the area with the highest solute concentration will draw water towards it. So if you have high solute outside of the cell, the cell will lose water and shrink. If you have higher solute in the cell and low solute in the extracellular compartment, the cell will gain water and swell. We're going to do an activity to practice this. So tonicity is how the osmolality of the extracellular fluid affects the size and shape of cells due to loss, which leads to cell shrinkage, or gain, which leads to, to cell swelling. We often use blood cells in these experiments because blood cells change their shape quite a lot when they swell or shrink, and it's a very nice visual for how that tonicity changes. An isotonic solution, which would be about 300 milliosmolar, is no change in cells. That will be in balance with the intracellular environment. Many of you who have worked in, in clinics and in hospitals have seen that we use 0.9% saline as an isotonic solution. If you do the calculation and you see that sodium chloride dissolves in water and you separate the sodium chloride molecules, you will see that 0.9% saline is a 300 milliosmolar solution. Hypotonic. Hypotonic is when you have low ECF. For example, lower than 0.9% saline. That's a low osmolality ECF. Water will enter the cells from the ECF and the cells will swell. Hypertonic. A high extracellular fluid sodium, or greater than 0.9% saline, has a high osmolarity. Water will leave the cells to enter the ECF, they will shrink, and the plasma will become hypervolemic. Of course, saying that the, cell, that the plasma becomes hypovolemic or hypervolemic is a gross generalization. Sometimes you have a hypotonic solution because you have too much water in the plasma, and vice versa. So we will apply this to clinical conditions as we move forward. All right, let me know if you have any questions. That's the end of this lecture, and we're going to move on to talking about water, sodium, and other electrolyte balance.